good morning everyone <clears throat> and uh, as our previous lecture was about disorders of primary hemostasis this one is about disorders of secondary hemostasis and again referring to my uh, lecture what you can say introduction to coagulation or hemostasis uh, what is the events happen in secondary hemostasis is simply uh, the plug which is formed between platelets okay and fibrinogen should be converted into fibrin and uh, when the fibrin is formed so of course like it means the uh, <clears throat> like the the clot is now strong because uh, uh, fibrin is simply cross linkages or stabilization of the clot further further and as you know the main players in secondary hemostasis is all the clotting factors and all the clotting factors are formed in liver except factor 8. So <clears throat> to start with disorders of secondary hemostasis is simply inability to form um, adequate fibrin clot so uh, what can be the reason simply clotting factors can be abnormal for, for, uh, clotting factors can be absent or all the things if you if you um, recall all the uh, flow charts which I show you in the first lecture for example calcium <coughs> all the players which uh, take part in that intrinsic and extrinsic pathway uh, whenever they are missing of course the patients will be having disorders of secondary hemostasis and again uh, important thing to remember in secondary hemostasis is simply uh, deep bleeds hematomas hem arthrosis coagulopathy okay so uh, <clears throat> chronically these patients present with like whenever they have any uh, damage to what you can say uh, a blunt trauma for example so there, there is a deep bleed in the in the in the muscles or for example you know the young active adults who are taking part in many sports they have deep bleed in uh, in the joints okay and uh, chronically of course the joints because of repeated deep uh, deep structure bleeds they may have what you can say uh, uh, swollen joints okay so uh, <clears throat> now uh, the classification uh, like which I show you in the first one you know here we will talk about a little detailed uh, what are the causes of you can say uh, secondary hemostasis what are the causes or classification how we can classify uh, the disorders of secondary hemostasis it could be hereditary or it could be acquired so in a hereditary I gave you the examples in, in that lecture. Hemophilias come at number first. Hemo, uh, hemophilias. Okay. Uh, which one? A. Hemophilia B. Hemophilia C. Okay. A, 9, and 11. So, uh, factor. A hemophilia A is factor 8, deficiency B is factor 9, and C is factor 11, right? So, you can say like von Willebrand disease, it's very closely related to hemophilia A. Why? Because factor 8 and von Willebrand factor, they, they work like in conjugation. Hemophilia B is also called as Christmas disease, okay? Or there can be any other factors, uh, clotting factors, I mean to say deficiency okay can be there uh, when we talk about acquired ones uh, I told you there could be many it could be liver diseases 
liver is the one which is forming all the clotting factors it could be renal diseases okay like for example glomerulopathies in which like the patients they lose a lot of blood vitamin k deficiency okay again you have an idea from pediatrics and you like i, I explained you when i explained you warfarin disseminated intravascular coagulation is one of them and uh, simply uh, if someone ha is uh, have some uh, clotting inhibitors though not so common but of course like when we talk about the causes we, we have to talk about everything so uh, hemophilia a uh, again like uh, what happens in the, these patients is like they have deficiency of what they have deficiency of factor 8 right and it's a very old and very well known type of condition guys okay hemophilia a deficiency uh, simply these are the patients by the way uh, who uh, like uh, hemophilia is the hereditary one okay so they, they 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 run in families right so okay i will discuss one hemophilia in detail okay hemophilia for example hemophilia a so what happens is like uh, it is x-linked recessive okay it's a hereditary disorder so x-linked uh, recessive condition okay occur in one in five thousand males so uh, now it could be mild it could be moderate uh, it could be severe type of condition uh, mild is when you can say factor 8 you know this one is like deficiency of which factor factor 8 okay 8 factor it should be factor 8 but here you know I'm writing like this way when factor 8 is present more than 5% to the normal values okay you know it is mild condition 1 to 5% is moderate and severe when the level of the factor is less than 1% okay level of the factor in these patients is less than 1% okay so now <clears throat> uh, this hemophilia is you know of course like it's a genetic disorder so like uh, what happens is you know these patients they have a lot of in like uh, internal or external bleeds okay time by time for example you know they, they go to a dentist and they take out the tooth and they found like the bleeding is not stopping rather rather like it is keep on bleeding okay or severe type of bleeding loss or not severe like there is more bl blood loss than normal you see usually when we go for dental extraction so what happens is like once our tooth is out so like uh, the bleeding stop after some time but in this one there is like more than expected bleeding simply okay so uh, so any type of surgical procedure uh, injections you know they keep on like they bleed more than the normal people so uh, simply like uh, uh, this is the most important thing and again like it is uh, hematoma hemarthrosis or coagulopathy you know again just remember three words and you would remember many things like there can be bleeding in the joints bleeding in the muscles okay so uh, chronically their joints become enlarged right there can be in intracerebral bleed as well and of course that 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 will be very dangerous type of condition of course whenever it, it, it is present so uh, like the dentist is a very good example because many people you know they go for what you can say dentist to get extraction and then they come to know you know like uh, uh, we have this condition okay so the same uh, now like you know uh, by the way hemophilia is like a, is a very well known disease because many many famous people in this world you know they had hemophilia as well so anyhow uh, how we diagnose this condition clinical feature is simply you know prolonged bleeding hematomas hematrosis okay 
So, how they diagnose that? Now, it is factor 8 deficiency, right? And if you remember from that clotting cascade, whenever factor 8 is absent, so what will happen? Intrinsic pathway. A, P, T, T will be prolonged. Because factor 8 plays roles just in intrinsic pathway, okay? But extrinsic pathway, PT will be normal. PT or INR, whatever you can say. And the diagnosis is simply made when we check factor 8, we found decreased level. Okay? So, of course, when the level is less than 1%, so severe, more than, more than 5% is present. Mild and 1-5% is moderate. So this one is uh, the important thing. Of course, like you can do genetic testing, of course, okay. Uh, nowadays, we can do genetic testing to check like uh, what the patient have. Uh, how we treat these patients is simply, uh, again, you have done one Billy-Brain disease, desmopressin, okay, in mild patient, in mild, milder conditions. You can give the death of person. But if the condition is moderate to severe, then simply give them what? Factor 8. Is moderate or severe, okay? Of course, uh, deliver the patient what they are lacking, that's it, okay? So, of course, especially when they are bleeding, we provide them factor 8, okay? Plus, again, the same drug. Tran zamic acid to control the bleeding to stop the bleeding okay this thing can be given so uh, this is like hemophilia a uh, there is hemophilia b also there is hemophilia c also okay uh, as i told you uh, what is hemophilia b, uh, b is again hemophilia b is also excellent to sessel uh, very less common than uh, hemophilia A. Hemophilia A is more common. And whenever it is X-linked recessive, guys, so remember one thing, X-linked recessive, so it will be present in males only, okay? Remember, females can be carrier, not affected. Uh, hemophilia B is X-linked recessive as well. So remember that thing that hemophilia B can also be just in males. Not in everyone else, okay? Hemophilia A is factor 8 deficiency. Hemophilia B is what? Factor 9 deficiency. So, hmm. same story, what you can say. Uh, okay. What you can say, same like fact, hemophilia A, you can remember about hemophilia B. Both they are excellent recessive. Both they can occur in males because they are excellent recessive. Both have again mild, moderate, and severe type of conditions, okay? And... Both will give exactly same picture because if you know extrinsic pathway, there is no role of factor eight and row, no role of factor nine. So intrinsic pathway will not be affected. Only extra sorry, extrinsic pathway will not be affected. Only intrinsic pathway will be affected. So when you will check in hemophilia B, APTT will be prolonged and PT will be prolonged as well. Uh, like to tell you the truth, you know, guys, if you want to me to like make one more slide, you know how easy to make. See, I'm copy pasting everything here, paste, just copy paste everything here and done. This is hemophilia B, right here B, which factor is deficient, factor 9, same story, same story, same story, APTT will be prolonged because factor 9 again it affect the intrinsic pathway only so it's really prolonged it does not affect there is no role of factor 9 in uh, extrinsic pathway pt will be normal so when you will check the levels factor 8 will be normal but factor 9 will be reduced there is no deficiency and when you will treat factor 9 okay that's it
there is no difference at all right hemophilia c this is present most mostly in jewish people jews ashkenazi nazi jewish population okay but hemophilia c is basically which is factor 11 deficiency it is autosomal recessive okay why it is not important guys because this one is so mild condition hemophilia c i'm talking about hemophilia c is so mild condition that it is uh, only diagnosed in adults factor deficiency okay it is autosomal recessive okay diagnosed in adults adult population okay and uh, <clears throat> uh, simply uh, treatment and everything remains same why because uh, guys remember um, in this one we will just provide or give them what factor 11 concentrate okay plus again the same thing antifibrinolytic drugs like trans Dynamic acid okay so everything will be same there will be no difference so <clears throat> it only occurs in Jewish people like it runs in those races okay now the world is of course more like a global village so <clears throat> now due to cross uh, marriages and all this stuff you know like diseases are becoming in coming in other races as well so they present in the same way oral bleeds and nasal bleeds and all this stuff okay uh, rest like uh, simply we diagnose it in 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 the same way okay as we diagnose the other 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 patients and nowadays you know like there are newer type of uh, what you can say treatments are available for example uh, what you can say gene therapies are also available nowadays okay uh, but, and they are uh, healing the people with, for hemophilia A and B. So now, um, uh, what is there uh, after that? What condition we have to study in the list is uh, liver diseases, guys. Uh, again, what is liver diseases? Of course, like uh, liver is the, uh, you can say, liver is the one uh, the you can say production house of what of all the proteins okay I think you guys must be better than me in this thing so uh, of course whenever there is any liver damage what happens like all the factors which are formed in the liver they will be not formed okay and uh, <clears throat> just factor 8 will be spared because all the factors are formed in the liver even factor 8 is also formed in the liver, but factor 8 is also formed in endothelial cells, okay? So, uh, simply all these things will be disturbed, okay? Uh, when we, when we, uh, 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 we can check the liver function test and uh, simply uh, one very important thing, guys. Uh, whenever there is any, any liver condition, uh, remember that thing that both primary and secondary hemostasis will be affected okay both of them will be affected why because in liver damage there is hypersplenism when there is hypersplenism it is going to damage more and more and more platelets when there is liver damage there is less proteins overall and proteins like which are fun doing different functions in the body they all will be disturbed okay so liver damage affect both the lines primary as well as secondary one so decreased level of platelets and uremia will be there platelets will not function normally and of course secondary hemostasis now all the factors are gone so whatever you will check you will check pt or uh, inr prolonged because intrinsic pathway extrinsic pathway 
clotting factors are affected. You will check APTT, it will be prolonged. Okay. So everything will be prolonged, right? Because what now the liver is damaged and all the clotting factors which are formed by the liver, they are damaged. I see. So uh, now this is very easy to understand. And what is the treatment of liver problem? Of course, treat the underlying cause. Like what is what is causing uh, what you can say the liver damage. Vitamin K deficiency is one of the cause, right? A vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin. And uh, what is a drug which counter vitamin K? Remember, guys, what is a drug which is vitamin K antagonist? You can say it is remember it is called as warfarin. I told you the mnemonic. 1940 72 Canada versus Soviets, right? So in 1972, basically one is 10. So 10, 9, 7, 2, protein C and protein S, right? All these things. So what will happen? 10, 9, 7, uh, 2, uh, protein C and protein S all will be gone right all will be affected okay in vitamin K deficiency I should write here deficiency okay so <clears throat> there are many reasons of vitamin K deficiency for example a newly born baby you know they have less vitamin K and antibiotic usage prolonged antibiotic usage can cause biliary problems Remember when there is no bile fluid, you know, all the fat soluble vitamins uh, cannot be absorbed. Liver diseases, anyone who have fat malabsorption, there is different conditions, intestinal diseases which can cause that. So there are different reasons of what you can say, vitamin K deficiency. So now one important thing to, if you will see over here, notice over here, vitamin K damage like affect all this one so these clotting factors mostly are the clotting factors of extrinsic pathway but this one for example is also it plays role in both okay extrinsic and intrinsic 10 is the meeting point of both extrinsic and intrinsic okay so what will happen when we when we see the picture when we see the blood so extrinsic pathway will surely will badly damaged or infected effect affected so pt will be prolonged okay but when you will check aptt which is to check the intrinsic pathway now two clotting factors are affected so it will be mildly prolonged okay why because all the other clotting factors are there but there are two clotting factors which play a role they are affected so how we can diagnose again we will check the level of these factors we found they will be raised what is the treatment guys see if the patient is on warfarin stop the vitamin k antagonist if the patient is taking antagonist okay and i guess antagonist right if the patient is taking for example what i'm i mean to say warfarin why give the patient vitamin k okay uh, vitamin k can be given per oral can be given iv okay so per oral if the if there is no act active bleeding okay but someone who is bleeding in bleeding give vitamin k iv okay so you can say vitamin k is a antidote of warfarin as well okay vitamin k is the antidote of warfarin as well okay if the patient if the patient is bleeding too much and cannot be stopped so what we can or life-threatening bleedings we can pay, give the patient vitamin k uh, what well, we can give the patient prothrombin complex concentrate pcc or fresh frozen plasma Okay, so in life-threatening bleeding disorders, in life-threatening bleeding, we can give patient 
we can give what we can give prothrombin concentrate or fresh frozen plasma fresh frozen plasma okay so this thing this thing is important so vitamin k decade efficiency give this picture okay so <clears throat> we have discussed uh, i think all of the things right renal disease like of course not here oh disseminated intravascular coagulation okay disseminated uh, seminated intravascular coagulation uh, basically you know guys this one is a very important topic in gynecology okay this, this is a very uh, uh, important topic in gynecology okay this is a condition in which two things are going on thrombosis and bleeding together see both things are going on the patient is bleeding and there is clot formation as well <laughs> so thrombus thrombosis and bleeding are going side by side okay why because these in the this is a condition in which there is disregard dysregulated okay like the regulation is lost dysregulated release of plasmin is there dysregulated release of plasmin okay so what is plasmin plasmin is an enzyme okay of course and uh, uh, what you can say the function of plasmin is simply to degrade uh, plasma proteins including fibrin okay what is the function of plasmin plasmin degrades fibrin clots plasmin degrades fibrin clots okay this is the main function of fibrin and by the way when 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 fibrin is degraded so what 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 form what is what is formed fibrin is formed of what fibrinogen right so simply when the fibrin is degraded the process is called a fibrinolysis of course okay and small small uh, what you can say things will be released so now uh, there like in these patients of disseminated intravascular coagulation there is dysregulated activation of what or release of what plasmin okay and thrombin okay so what plasmin is doing plasmin is degrading fibrin clots and what thrombin is doing thrombin is making as the name shows thrombin thrombin is forming what thrombin is forming thrombus clots okay thrombin is also an enzyme guys okay thrombin is also a enzyme so of course uh, thrombin uh, is the one uh, that is converting fibrinogen to fibrin okay plasmin degrades fibrin clots thrombin what is the function of thrombin thrombin is also enzyme thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin okay so see both the process are going on plasmin is activated thrombin is activated it will keep on dissolving the clots bleeding can occur it will keep on forming the clots okay so thrombus can form so this, in this, this disease there is both thrombus and bleeding going on together okay so now <clears throat> what is the main thing why we are discussing this condition or why what makes this condition very important when both these pathways are activating activated see nowadays pandemic is going on all, all over the world and what's going on that the countries are running off their supplies the masks they had the uh, goggles they had the protective clothings they had clo clo clothings they had hazmat suits everything is exhausted okay why because they are used too much so when this one and this one they both are activated 
clots are forming and clots are destroying as well okay degraded as well so what happens there is depletion of platelets because all things will be used up coagulation factors and fibrinogen so this is simply the body will be exhausted of platelets coagulation factors and fibrinogen so simply this is an important condition because there is it's a life-threatening condition okay it's life-threatening and can lead to bleeding or hemorrhage with thromboembolism what is thromboembolism guys again the patient can had stroke the patient can had myocardial infarction the patient can had kidney infarction the patient can had any infections so why these condition occur basically due to many surgical or obstetric conditions okay that's that's why i told you it is a very important topic in gyne ops okay very important topic in gyne ops so uh, basically what happened in surgery or in gyne ops like in, in many obstetrical cases that there is endothelial damage and release of many inflammatory cytokines and due to that all both these what you can say cascades can can be activated so uh, simply uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation can occur in number of conditions surgical and gynecological okay uh, for example uh, someone uh, like uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, what you can say one of the complication is you know ops complication for example if the fetus died inside and the labor is not started and you know the dead fetus is still inside so after some days you know dic will start and that's why the doctors they can they keep on what you can say checking the clotting profile malignancy is this thing can occur okay infections can cause this thing as well as trauma can cause this thing shock can cause this thing there are many reasons uh, for example crush injuries can cause an example of trauma solid tumors can cause antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can cause malaria can cause snake bite can cause uh, sepsis can cause many causes are there of this condition so clinical picture a picture <clears throat> i think like there is no point of discussing clinical picture because i already told you what is going on simply uh, these are the patients who have what you can say uh, both things going on together right both things are running out running together they have bleeding with thrombosis or simply you can write bleeding with clotting okay in very easy words it will be going on so see when bleeding is going on what can happen the patient can go into shock okay when bleeding is happening the patient case can go into shock petechias can form on the body petechia patient can start bleed from injection sites from wounds they will start bleeding from the wounds from gingiva so they they start bleeding from different points okay they can even have intracranial bleed most weird complications i just write petechia guys purpura ecchymosis all these things you know they may have bleeding in the genito urinary tract hematuria they may have bleeding in the stools okay they may have epistaxis how come i forget you know this thing in the start in the in the end epistaxis can occur so this is all bleeding 
things, okay? And what will happen when the patient will be having small clot formation all over the body? The first and the most important thing, remember the neurological infarcts. Infarcts in the brain can lead to delirium. Can lead to coma. Can lead to seizures. Okay. There could be ischemia of any structure like ischemia of what? Kidneys. Ischemia of the skin. Okay. Uh, ischemia of the GIT. Whenever the clot is formed, it will go and it will block the blood supply of any tissue and there will be ischemia and there can be gangrene. Gangrene of the tissue. Okay. <clears throat> so see, these are the features. These are the clotting features. These are the bleeding features. So in this one, what we do, we do a whole clotting profile. Okay. We do a whole clotting profile. What we found, remember everything is illustrated. Start thinking from the primary hemostasis. What will happen to platelets? Decreased. Okay. Think about secondary hemostasis. What happened to PT? Clotting factors are exhausted. Prolonged. What will happen to APTT? Intrinsic pathway. Everything will be lost, prolonged. What will happen to thrombin time? Prolonged. Because everything is exhausted. Okay. Whatever you will check, whatever you will check, you will find it prolonged. Okay. So whatever it is, PT will be decreased, uh, platelets will be decreased. PT, AP, TT, TT, everything will be prolonged, right? Everything will be prolonged. Now, one more investigation, which is a new investigation, that's why I'm talking about that now. When the fibrin is degraded, the process is called as fibrinolysis, there is fibrinogen degradation products in the brain, in the blood. Of course, when the clot will be broken down, so fibrinogen is broken down so that is called as what fibrinogen degradation products we also call that thing the other name is d dimers d dimers okay so when we check the d dimers it will be increased okay it will be increased so <clears throat> Uh, okay, so this is how we diagnose uh, DIC. How to treat, of course, treat the underlying cause, first of all. Stop the factor which is initiating DIC. Treat the underlying cause. The most important thing. Then, of course, it's an emergency, it's a life threatening condition. Pay attention on hemodynamic status. Okay, maintain blood pressure. You can give, you have to give maybe IV fluids, maybe you have to put the patient on ventilator, maybe you have to directly give the patient blood. Okay, so what we can do for hemorrhage? Hemorrhage. Now, see, guys, this is so bad condition that if we will treat hemorrhage aggressively, the patient can go into more coagulation, can die because of that. If we will treat with anticoagulation aggressively, the patient can bleed more and die. So we are stuck in the middle. So we can give them platelet transfusion to stop hemorrhage. Okay, platelet transfusion can be given. Fresh frozen plasma can be given. And cryo precipitate precipitate can be given to stop the bleeding. Okay. Our aim is to basically maintain the platelets greater than fifty multiply by the uh, multiply by ten raised to the power. Uh, <coughs> 
okay so we have to maintain the platelets in this range okay in BIC maintain the platelets in this range Okay, so this is like we have to maintain the platelets in this range. Uh, maintain the hemoglobin greater than 80, okay, and avoid hypothermia. So we can give them fresh frozen plasma, we can give them cryoprecipitate, okay, uh, just to treat what you can say, these patients, okay. And if the patient is in thrombotic phase, phase, of course, put the patient on low molecular weight heparin. Okay. So, <clears throat> I hope you understand this condition. Okay. I teach you this D dimer things in, in, in pulmonary embolism. And I teach you like, you know, whenever like pulmonary embolism suspe suspicion is there, we do D-dimers. If D-dimers are raised, you know, it's a very good idea that there is some, uh, what you can say, fibrinolysis going on in the body, which shows like there is some clot formation. So think about pulmonary embolism in that case, okay. Uh, so this thing, so this thing is important, very important condition. So that's all about what you can say that conditions or the disease related to secondary hemostasis. Just few words about hypercoagulable disorders. Okay, uh, because we had already covered this thing, you know, guys, uh, in DVT in pulmonary embolism. Okay, so what are these patients? You know, who uh, who are the patients who have hypercoagulable disorders? They present with thrombosis, DVT, and all these things, okay? Basically, there are certain conditions in which the patient, the people can become hypercoagulable. For example, pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. Malignancies, in different malignancies, the patient become hypercoagulable, okay? <coughs> so, of course, we look for that, okay? So, whenever anyone especially have, you know, recurrent... Uh, you can say thrombosis then we go and we uh, investigate them more and more and more for example just to see why they are going into hypercoagulable state i told you in one lecture like in previous lecture that when we put any patient on warfarin first they go into hypercoagulable state then they go into hypercoagulable state why because the first proteins which can which basically are exhausted is protein c and protein s and when protein C and protein S are exhausted, what happens is um, simply uh, the patient become hypercoagulable for a while and then go into hypocoagulable state, okay? And there is a thing called as warfarin-induced skin necrosis, okay? That is a result of that thing as well. So, <clears throat> most of this, these hypercoagulable disorders, you know, they run in families and we get a family history. Uh, of uh, hypercoagulable state using OCPs and OCP with smoking is a good combination a very good package to get hypercoagulable state so this thing uh, and then there are many 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 other conditions many syndromes thrombophilias you know simply uh, what you can say in which the patients can become uh, hypercoagulable so whenever anyone have hypercoagulable state you know we have to investigate all their workup we have to do. We have to do CBC, uh, coagulation studies, liver function test, renal function test, uh, malignancy, just to search for any malignancies there. Okay. Uh, we can do their uh, antiphospholipid antibodies. You will understand when you will do rheumatology. Okay. Uh, so we check like all these things. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 
the same okay so i will not go in too much detail of this thing because uh, like you know uh, of course like whatever i will teach here i can ask in the exam so i think to make the thing simple for you guys so <clears throat> there are there are mnemonics as well you know to remember the hypercoagulability causes or states for example protein c and as i keep on talking about that thing so protein c deficiency is there right protein s deficiency is there there is a mnemonic called as calm apes c a r calm apes okay so c is for protein c deficiency s is for protein s deficiency okay then there is anti phospholipid antibody syndrome when you will study rheumatology you will have very good idea about that uh, then there is factor 5 laden l laden l e i d e n m is for malignancies a is for anti thrombin deficiency see thrombin form the clot anti thrombin stop the thrombin so when anti thrombin is not there so thrombin is going to more make more clots okay so anti thrombin deficiency p is for pro thrombin and i is for in, you can say e is for 8 or increased factor 8 there are many people who have increased factor 8 okay so now uh, anyone who have hypercoagulability they have increased chances of having clots in the body okay so like for example i will tell you factor 5 laden uh, deficiency for example okay so it is also called as activated protein c resistance activated protein c resistance basically this is the most common inherited or hereditary thrombophilia and it is common in european people okay so there is why it is called as factor 5 because there is a mutation in factor 5 gene okay so basically due to that mutation factor 5 is not activated in these people okay sorry when is whenever there is mutation in this one factor 5 cannot be inactivated so factor 5 keep on staying activated okay so it will keep on forming or increase risk of forming clots is there i told you like this one uh, p pro thrombin gene mutation okay pro thrombin pro thrombin gene mutation right so now again there is a small type of mutation in these people okay small type of mutation in these people and uh, what happens due to that mutation prothrombin level in the body is high and when prothrombin is more more thrombin is there when more thrombin is there it is going to form more clot okay so the first one c and s is you know protein c and s deficiency okay so basically you know uh, <coughs> uh, what is the function of uh, Uh, you can say protein c uh, protein c basically inactivates inactivates factor factor 5 activated so when the factor 5 is activated remember from that cascade protein c inactivates factor 5 okay not just 5a also uh it so when protein c is deficient so these two remain in activated form okay whenever protein c is not there or deficiency is there so these two will remain in activated form and keep on forming clot clots simply and the body will go into hypercoagulable state and what is the function of protein s protein s is a cofactor needed by protein c 
So when protein S is not there, protein C cannot function properly. Okay, so that's the level, that's the thing uh, to remember. So simply you can see that factor five either it's fact about factor five or either it's about uh, prothrombin or either it's about protein C and protein S deficiency. Simply all these have an effect on inactivation of clotting factors and when clotting factors will not be inactivated what will happen the body will stay in hypercoagulable state okay uh, antithrombin deficiency now this thing i think is very 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 easy so what is antithrombin as, as i told you antithrombin as the name shows antithrombin should inactivate thrombin so when antithrombin is deficient thrombin cannot be deactivated so when thrombin will not be deactivated more clot formation okay so <clears throat> uh, antithrombin basically inactivates thrombin in the absence of heparin okay and uh, uh, what you can say these patients you know these people they, they like this is autosomal dominant condition okay so simply uh, uh, these people are at risk of what you can say uh, developing more and more clots okay so like very very easy things you know and uh, same thing you know with calm apes i told you elevated factor 8 levels of course when they are more so uh, risk of forming clots is more uh, then one of a very important thing which you will study in detail that is called as antiphospholipid syndrome okay it is called as what anti phospholipid syndrome you will study this thing in uh, rheumatology you will study this thing in again gyne -Ops very important so <clears throat> what is these people by the way uh, <laughs> like these are the people like it comes in, in in patients you know who have systemic lupus erythematosus or simply other rheumatological disorders okay and clinically they have a recurrent thrombosis episode and in females why it, it will you will come you will study this thing in gaining gaining off because these females who have this syndrome, they present with repeated abortions. Abortion in the first trimester. Okay. They present with repeat abortions. Abortion in the first trimester. As well as you can say giving birth to premature babies. Okay. So now what we found in their body. Uh, is anti cardio lipin antibodies okay and many other you know lupus anticoagulant and all this stuff can be found okay the exact cause is not known okay but what is known like these antibodies they basically interact with the platelet membrane phospholipid okay and they activate platelets more when these antibodies interact with platelets they basically activate the platelets okay and one more thing it also is believed that you know uh, antiphospholipid syndrome in these people you know there is inhibition of protein c pathway uh, i hope like you understand what is protein c pathway until now okay Rest guys, remember, uh, malignancies is a hypercoagulable state. Malignancies, pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. Many females who are taking hormones, they can go into hypercoagulable state. Oral contraceptive pills, which anyways had hormones, uh, they can go into hypercoagulable state, okay? Hypercoagulability hypercoagulability means what that uh, they they will form more and more uh, clots in the body 
and uh, anyone who have hyperquarkable state we call it as don't get confused if, if your books say this thing that they are called as thrombophilias as the name shows guys thrombophilias like thrombus loving okay so thrombophilias there is more and more and more thrombus formation okay so many causes are congenital like factor 5 latent deficiency prothrombin deficiency okay and so antithrombin deficiency protein c and protein s deficiency okay and there are many 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 others like familial dysfibrogenemia is one of them and there are many acquired causes so acquired causes i told you malignancies pregnancies hormone ocps and yes very important Uh, collagen vascular disorder or rheumatological rheumatological is by, by the way not a nice thing you can say collagen uh, diseases okay so systemic lupus erythematosus for example okay okay if you remember heparin induced thrombocytopenia okay is uh, again one of them so uh, all these things you know and also yes liver liver diseases or kidney diseases okay and kidney more in this case of course because you know when the, when the kidney diseases are there you know they, we can lose a lot of protein and protein c s and the patient can go into hypercoagulable state if you know uh, in in next uh, unit in nephrology we are going to study uh, uh, nephrotic syndrome for example okay nephrotic syndrome is a hypercoagulable state so oc ocp is i talk about okay estrogen for example uh, which is in ocp which can be females can take in hormones uh, they can go and uh, uh, remember guys obesity is also one of the risk factor i am not saying cause it's a risk factor which uh, can lead to more and more and more clot formations okay uh, so this thing uh rest of course uh uh like uh, uh of course like i talked on many times about the malignancies whenever we are suspecting malignancies in someone we go for complete work up okay uh, we go for cbc we go for lfts we go for ct scan of the head neck chest abdomen Uh, you can do uh, what you can say uh, one very important day. yeah bone scan you can do right uh, bone scan you can do in these patients of course like to check like where where, where is the malignancies you can do mammogram if it's a female you can do cervical screening or cervi- cervi- cervical cancer in males you can do psa or prostatic surface antigen okay so just to just to find out what, what where is the cancer so malignancy is remember you know it's a hypercoagulable state and they can lead to increase what you can say uh, formation of thrombus rest guys we had done dvt okay we had done pulmonary embolism uh, of course and how we treat that if you remember we give them you know low molecular weight heparin uh, we give them uh, heparin we can we can give them alternative to that like uh, erga ergotabren or like drugs like this we already talk about them the, them or dabigatran or all this all these drugs you know which are new drugs of course we can give them okay so uh, that's all by the way uh, because we had done those that, that topic of course like uh, so this is this this topic have relation with pulmonary embolism or uh, venous thromboembolism or uh, deep vein thrombosis okay which was tried if you remember in dvd so uh, that's it uh, if you had time you can you can revise venous thromboembolism you can revise what is the initial treatment we give what what is the uh, late treatment or how we maintain their inr we put them on warfarin and what oral anticoagulants we can give them okay uh, 
and uh, how we can treat cancer patients and when we treat so all these guidelines you can you can go through thank you so much guys for listening this lecture